it's more difficult because it's not like a prepared little speech. So, guys, um, also I had a witty bit of banter to begin with about aphrodisiacs, but it's much harder to talk about sex uh, when the lads aren't around and you're just on your own with a room of predominantly women out there. Um, so yeah, guys, we were going to be talking about zinc tonight, and uh, often at the start of the talk, we would um have a little chat about what's been happening during the week, and I thought I would just highlight a post that you know, I, what's what I love doing is researching, you know, and digging around and finding stuff, and I'm looking at some quote that's this appalling white coat vet, which um I'll have a video out on her by the end of the week. And some of the quotes, the things that come out of their mouth and the, the references that they use to support their statements, which thrills me because you get to go through it and go, oh my God, this is what you use. Um, but that led me to a study. And so I can thank this vet for leading me to this this wonderful study. And the study is unbelievably uh, two, three years old. Uh, and I don't know why I didn't pick up on it um, so well at the time. But let me just read it out to you so I can settle into this. Let's <coughs> get Used to being on my own here. Okay. Holding the fort. Researchers compared the health markers in client-owned dogs fed a raw diet to markers in dogs fed a high-quality extruded kibble. To measure their health on the outside, they used a composite clinical health score. That's a CCS. Um, and in this instance, the researchers measured dental score, otitis score, ear issues, and integument, the, an external kind of assessment of the dog. And they found the raw fed dogs score significantly higher, as you might expect. But now we have a study to prove it, which is nice. Um, and, but then they went on to, to assess their health on the inside. They measured serum alkaline phosphatase activity. Google, what's that do? Uh, this is where an elevation in this is correlated with disease of the liver and bone and a few other bits and pieces. Safe to say you don't want it raised. The raw fed dogs scored significantly lower in the worrying markers than dry fed dogs. Um, when I say significantly, I mean statistically significantly. OK, so it's important when you say significant, they were significantly lower. OK, they, they were very confident of the results between the two groups of dogs, which is very interesting. They also measured their globulin levels. These are antibodies. They are elevated in inflammatory conditions, infections, some cancers. You don't want them raised either. And the dry fed, in the dry fed dogs, they were significantly so. In fact, in both cases, the p-value was less than 0.001, which means highly significant, highly confident. There's a massive difference between those two groups. An almost complete whitewash for the raw-fed community. Interestingly, uh, the raw-fed dogs uh, had more lymphocytes, though, raised when fighting an infection, which was just about significant with a p-value of 0.05, right on the line, uh, any higher than that, and it wouldn't be considered significant. There are only 25 dogs in each group, okay, so it's not a huge study. And the authors note that more research is urgently needed to determine the impact of diet processing and nutrient content on canine health. Hear, hear, so say all of us. That study was three years ago. Wouldn't you think a veterinary department somewhere would have repeated this study using a lot more dogs by now, just in case they were recommending a product that was making the world's dogs ill? Naughty Connor. Sadly, comparing the health of fresh and dry fed dogs is not something the veterinary industry has any interest in doing. Dog risk in Helsinki aside. Mad, eh? Let's recap, recap the score for them. Three studies showing raw meaty bones safe and clean teeth. Two studies showing dry fed dogs have more inflammatory markers. Two studies showing dry fed dogs suffer more gut disease. One study showing dry fed dogs suffer more atopy, skin disease. One study showing dry fed dogs have more histamine release in the skin layers. One study showing dry fed dogs suffer more ear disease. One study showing raw fed dogs are healthier. Now, thanks to this, one study showing raw fed dogs see the vets less. That was a result of a survey. Um, zero studies showing dry dog food is better for any health condition whatsoever. That's quite damning. That's quite, quite a damning list, Connor. Well done. Add to these awkward facts. Kibble poisons far more humans with salmonella than raw, raw dog food. The majority of them toddlers under two years of age. And the fact complete dry dog food has killed tens of thousands of dogs and cats over multiple instances in the last few decades alone. Complete raw dog and cat food, less than 10 pets in the literature. So you have to wonder, the veterinary industry recommends against feeding fresh pets fresh food because... See, and, and the, the caveat, the line they always say will be more research is needed, more research. They need more research before they can decide, says absolutely nobody with half a brain. Forgive, but never forget.
that was my preachy little jab in the guts today. Uh, so I thought I'd read that out to settle me into a little chat about zinc. And I have to say, usually when uh, it's when we do the nutrient bit, often sometimes you'll you'll kind of hear of nutrients and you go, oh, I've got some great stuff to say about that. And zinc is an easy one. It's low hanging fruit for me. Uh, very, very enjoyable because I, I'm not quite sure how many people before I started researching the book and before I released the book, um, somebody casually said it to me one time that the AFCO um, daily requirements uh, for zinc in pet food are insanely high. And, you know, it wasn't something that was on my radar. I remember as a manufacturer thinking they were too high and vitamin E was high, but I didn't give it much more thought until somebody said, is there not an analysis of prey animals out there where we could look at the zinc content of prey animals and see how much the zinc they have just to see how much a dog might normally be consuming? And I thought, wonderful, because the problem dry dog food has, and this is what I'm, where I'm going with this, uh, is that it uses crap zinc, hard to absorb zinc, so they have to use a lot of it. And so if you're AFCO, dry pet food manufacturers, and you're making the rules for dry pet food manufacturers and they want to use zinc oxide, the porous form of zinc, because it's the cheapest, wouldn't want to use the good stuff, chelated zinc and all the others. No, no. Um, so you use more of the bad zinc oxide. And so that results in dry pet food manufacturers thinking that the zinc need is quite high uh, of dogs, but there's no studies to suggest that at all. Um, so look, I picked out a few little bits and pieces about zinc. Um, first of all, I just wanted to highlight zinc oxide in dry pet food is awful. It's crap. Nobody thinks it's a good form of zinc. Um, uh, I'm just pulling little bits from the book here just, uh, just to keep the flow going. I know that despite authors noting that zinc oxide is poorly utilized by the dog and that natural zinc is utilized 60 to 80% better by the dog, zinc oxide remains the zinc of choice for dry pet food manufacturers. Hmm, that's strange. Authors repeatedly demonstrate that dogs fed diets containing zinc oxide have poor hair growth and coat condition. Isn't that strange? Poor hair growth and coat condition on the zinc oxide and they continue to use zinc oxide. And so what they do is um, there's, they will use uh, plenty of it, okay? Particularly because, as we're going to highlight with the next point, there's a number of things in dry food that get in the way of zinc being absorbed, like uh, phytic acid and, and calcium. So they, they try and beat this. So, you know, if you fight a phytic acid and calcium in the mix, it binds the zinc. Here, listen to this. Phytic acid is entirely resistant to cooking. When present, it will happily bind to calcium, zinc, magnesium, and iron rendering them difficult or impossible to absorb by the dog. A study of iron absorption in cereal porridges fed to humans found a 12-fold increase in the absorption of iron when the phytic acid was removed from the food. It's crazy. Do you remember the studies of gladiator bones where they were eating lots of cereals and they found that they're all zinc deficient because uh, of all the phytic acid they're eating? Other experimenters have examined the effect of phytic acid on depression fighting zinc and magnesium. Uh, and I did a few more references there. Okay. To make matters worse, zinc availability in dogs is subject to the presence or absence of dietary antagonists, such as calcium. Excess calcium, particularly in the presence of phytates, found in cereals, bind zinc particularly, impairing growth and mineral utilization in rats and dogs. Seven references I put after that, if the veterinary community wanted to read them, which is bad news considering the amount of calcium and cereal used in pet food. Unbelievably, uh, when they test dry uh, pet food and canned pet food, it can be really high in calcium. And the reason for that is instead of using actual meat in their products, they use bone meal. They call it meat and bone meal. Actually, they call it dehydrated meat now. <laughs> you know, can you believe they're allowed to do that? It's actually meat and bone meal. Meat and bone meal is actually bone meal. So they put lots of bone meal in their products and bone meal comes with lots of calcium. And well, they really want to use bone meal because bone meal doesn't cost a lot and enables them to write meat on the label, but it's actually bone meal, which is calcium, which means lots of calcium goes into these products. I remember a, a product by Hills Pet Food when uh, Susan Tixon sent it off to be analyzed. She didn't touch it. She bought it from a shop and sent it straight to the lab, which is very clever because that way they can't give out to her. And it was the urinary care product was excessive in calcium by some huge figure. Type in uh, pet food test results, truth about pet food or Susan Tixon, and you'll see those results. Uh, incredibly high calcium readings in the in the kidney product made by Hills Pet Food. So uh, check that out. Well done, Hills, for, for a kidney product. You would think of all products, they would be careful of calcium, which kidneys don't like when they're properly sick. 
from eating dry pet food. Um, so uh, where am I? Simply including more zinc oxide is not the answer either, uh, as excess zinc can result in interaction with other minerals, reducing the availability of intrinsic copper, for example. Isn't that interesting? So you can't just jam in loads more zinc oxide. Um, and also we have a problem that we don't talk about where these hard to digest George Jetson mineral supplements that they put into products, the dog, you know, they put in huge amounts of this hard to absorb mineral. Where do you think the rest of that hard to absorb mineral goes? It goes down into your intestines where it upsets the gut floor. It's not normal, but there will always be life down there that goes, oh, lovely, zinc oxide. I'll have that. And you grow them. And the reason we know this is from studies of pigs because they've got loads and loads of studies of zinc oxide upsetting the gut floor of pigs. In fact, it upsets the gut floor as much as the antibiotics they use in raising the pigs. So excess crappy minerals is a problem. It doesn't just, you know, oh, we'll just put in more zinc oxide. So it's a problem. Uh, one more issue with dry pet food that they don't talk about is the effect of fiber. And uh, fiber affects the amount of zinc in your product. You can't put in lots of fiber and expect zinc absorption to be normal in particularly a meat eater. Uh, and this is particularly worrying for dogs on light dry food. Light dry food means they keep the carbohydrate content up. Uh, critically, you must keep the carbs up. Said nobody going to the gym. Keep your bread roll content up to 50, 60 percent. That's really important for building those arms, you know. Despite studies showing the more protein you feed a dog, you know, the better their weight loss. Uh, but let's ignore those and keep the carbohydrate content and protein low. But what we can do is we can just pump in a lot of hard to digest fiber, like a runway model choosing chewing paper tissue before a, before a show. That's how they diet uh, obese dogs. They show it's not a good way of dieting dogs. It's only going to work for dogs that are living in a cage. So they can say, this product is clinically proven to result in weight loss because they remove 15% of the calories by putting in 15% cellulose, which is impossible to digest. What effect does that have on the gut floor? It's terrible. It totally results in gut dysbiosis that you're going to find a bacteria that will happily eat this new um, this new food source. But also it affects how the dog can uh, reabsorb bile, which results in taurine deficiencies. DCM, remember, the, um, the fiber content of the food was a big thing there. Can be, as well as the fact there isn't a lot of taurine in the food in the first place because they don't like putting meat in uh, foods for meat eaters. Study here, uh, Burkholder and Bauer in 1998 um, found dogs on reduced energy intake dry diets, light dry foods, had a sub suboptimal intake of essential nutrients, especially protein. Well, that's not good, is it, when you're trying to lose weight, uh, retain lean muscle mass? What happened that? They documented considerable net losses of trace elements in dogs fed these diets. Um uh, containing increased amounts of hard to digest carbohydrates, most notably a depression of zinc and iron. So there we go. Too much phytic acid from the cereals they put in there, too much calcium from the bone meal they put in there, too much fiber. From... And they use zinc oxide as their zinc source. Is there any reason that dry fed dogs are going around with these scaldy dry coats and big elbow calluses as one of the, one of the uh, symptoms of it? Um, and it's, it's, you know, when the when the study that I read out at the start, they found a better co-condition on the dogs and they changed to raw. Well, obviously, you know, now they're getting not only lots of protein as opposed to the minimum amount of protein, which the veterinary sector is the only way, says is the only way to feed a meat eater. You must feed them the minimum amount of protein. What parent wants to give their kids the minimum amount of protein? How is that not the biggest point in the dry raw food scandal? Um so, but the zinc bit is, is, is the rest of it. Now you're getting good natural zinc. And while you might have it slightly less in the food, it's natural zinc, which is much easier absorbed. And you'll see the effect of that on skin, on hair and everywhere else that zinc is important. So, uh, yeah, it's just, you can now start to see why so many dry fed dogs are deficient in zinc. It's interesting that AFCO doesn't actually have any maximums in place for the amount of zinc that manufacturers can include. Isn't that a bit worrying? No maximums. You can use as much as you like. Just a quote from the book here. It's thus worrying that only a handful of nutrient maximums get a mention in the AFCO feed profile, which is strange. And many of these seem to be disappearing. For instance, up until 2007, the maximum amount of crude zinc permitted was 1,000 milligrams per kilo of dry food. That is a ferocious amount of zinc when, you know, uh, dogs need 120 milligrams for dry food. But you can pop in, you know, eight times more, nine times more. It's grand every single meal. In 2007, AFCO decided to remove this maximum as it was based on the maximum tolerance concentration recommended for swine rations. I swear to God. Up until 2007, the amount of zinc and iron in your pet food was worked out based on swine rations. Pigs. You know, talking about dogs here. 
There is no maximum for zinc in place today. You can use as much as you like. It's a touch worrying that, isn't it? In their revised version, the figure drops to 100 milligrams per kilo of dry food. That's how much zinc they recommend for dogs now. Um, but even at this level, this new lowered level, 100, mil 100 milligrams of zinc per kilo, you know, you will struggle to find any prey animal that offers anything close to that zinc content. I think most are around 40, 50, 60 milligrams per kilo. Uh, so it turns out when a dog is fed his natural diet, he's deficient in zinc. And this means should you be formulating a complete raw dog food, as I do for many companies, you know, you're left with this quandary where if you want to say complete according to AFCO and Fediaf, you know, complete according to Ronald McDonald's School of Nutrition, you have to get the zinc content up, which means you're running around trying to find ingredients with, with lots more zinc in them. You know, now you'd be hard pressed trying to find more zinc, um, um, an ingredient more suitable than like red meat you know bones plenty of zinc in that as we'll talk about later but um uh, seeds are a pretty good source too so you'll find some seeds going into foods and that's okay dogs would eat whole birds and some seeds that way so pre-soaked seeds without the husk on the outside of them i don't see a big problem a little bit of phytic acid goes in there but a good bit of zinc and uh, vitamin e and all sorts of things so they're the sort of things that people have to do to keep the uh, pet food gods happy, even though they make absolutely zero nutritional sense. If anything, you're just putting in a food that probably you wouldn't have put in if the, the AFCO profile wasn't so ridiculous. Um, and that's if there's any zinc in dry pet food at all. Check this out. Hodgkinson in 2004 analyzed 33 brands of dry food for growing dogs for pups. Among a range of issues they found, and they found a lot, the author found two products contained inadequate levels of calcium, and seven had an incorrect calcium to phosphorus ratio, and another seven had insufficient zinc. So seven of the 33, one quarter of them, had an incorrect calcium to phosphorus ratio, which is so detrimental if that's the only product you're eating every single day, and that's crap calcium and crap phosphorus, crap phosphorus, not the good stuff, not like a fresh bone. Uh, but seven of the 33... One quarter, one fifth of them had insufficient zinc. I mean, that is crazy. They couldn't even put in enough of the crap zinc oxide for these growing pups. Imagine trying to grow limbs on this incorrect calcium to phosphorus ratio, not enough zinc, and you want these pups to have robust joints. Dry food has an awful lot to answer for, guys. Um, okay, that's enough slagging off dry food, but I just enjoy it. It's so easy because for all the vets that listen to our talks every week, I just thought it might be useful useful for them to hear some facts. And for the rest of you, hearing the issues is kind of like a warm hug, isn't it? When you see a study that kind of reaffirms exactly what you've been saying for years. It's a great feeling. Smug. Can't beat a bit of smugness now and again. We're all guilty of it. Uh, zinc deficiency. Okay, zinc deficiency in pups will impair mineral utilization and lead to poor abnormal. This is great, just me talking, actually. I'm just getting loads done. I just, uh, great. Who needs the other two? They said, they said, don't bother doing anything, Connor. We hate everyone. We don't. We just don't care about them. So it doesn't matter. Affect them. It doesn't matter. We'll just do it next week and they'll be happy with whatever we tell them to do. And I'm like, no, Brad and Nick, don't speak about our public and our fans like that. That's just not on. I'm, you know, always disgusted. So I just said, I'm going to do this because. I really care about the fans. Um, so, yeah, it's just I was disappointed to hear that from them, really. But the power goes to their head, the money and the power, and they're, like, going around just, yeah, pushing people around. I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it at all. Uh, zinc deficiency in pups will impair mineral utilisation and lead to poor abnormal growth of dry, flaky skin with possible lesions. That's interesting. Particularly in the foot pads. Cracked, dry foot, pa uh, foot pads and noses, anyone? Very common in the dry-fed dogs. I'm telling you, it's less common in raw-fed dogs if the lads are here to verify it. Um, I made all that up about them pushing people around. They haven't pushed people around in years, ever since they've stopped drinking. Um, that's another lie, I'm sorry, just in case people are not familiar with my sarcasm. Um, but yeah, the lads would verify that, I'm sure. Crusty elbows, crusty noses, crusty dry pads. I remember my old girl, my old dog, oh, Meg used to have these dry pads. I used to think that. Uh, Duds has lovely soft, wet pads. Um, hmm, not wet pads, they're not wet. But they're uh, they're nice and soft. Um, they're not even that soft. They've got a the little rough bit on the side. But uh, anyway, Connor, let's move on. Uh, with secondary skin infections, thick crusts on the elbows and dull coat. There was three references after that. Who thought that elbow calces were from lying on concrete? Um, in, maybe now and again, but if you've got six or seven dogs in your 
concrete kennel uh, and only one of them has elbow calluses, that kind of puts your theory to bed. Uh, not all dogs get elbow calluses from lying on concrete. Definitely not. Uh, maybe some do, but uh, not all do. It is a lack of zinc uh, and a few other issues, I'm sure, can be. But what is cool, a temporary solution for that is to get a, a nut oil, which is high in zinc and vitamin E, like an almond oil or, or a, a hemp seed oil or, you know, what a nut oil. Um, is it seed or nut? Seed is a nut, isn't it? Oh, God, thank God the lads aren't listening to that. Well, I can't edit it now because I have to post this. Um, what was I talking about? So you rub the seed oil on the elbow callus anyway, and I'm not messing. If you do that two or three times a day, like you'll see hair growing back on the elbow callus within a matter of like days. And one in two people that try that will definitely verify that for me. It's it's so interesting. I must post that up again, actually, on the page and say it to people. It doesn't work for everybody, but uh, it, it's really cool. But getting zinc in the diet would be good. Getting the dog off dry dog food and getting them onto a proper food would uh, be the number one uh, source of zinc for the dog. Um, it's interesting to note that another symptom of zinc deficiency in humans is called hypogusia. Does anybody know what that is? That is where your taste buds stop working and renders food tasteless. And I thought that must be a serious advantage for dogs trying to eat the pet food every single day. Oh, a oh, oh, little bit of fun. Um, okay, best zinc sources. Look, you don't need to. If you're feeding real food, you are not going to be deficient in zinc. There's just too much zinc in meat. Oh, too much. There's five, six, seven milligrams of five milligrams, let's say, of um, zinc in uh, 100 grams of beef, red beef, you know. There's more than double that if you're feeding them liver, you know, so you're, he's getting plenty of zinc. Dogs need, they reckon, based on AFCO, nonsense, three milligrams of zinc per day, per, per kilo of dog per day, three milligrams. Um, So, you know, uh, your 10 kilo dog might need 30 milligrams of, um, of zinc. You know, that is based on AFCO nonsense. Uh, and that sounds like a huge amount of zinc. Um. But it's kind of like eating a whole rabbit or a rat anyway. Uh, so it's like that's quite quite a lot of food for a 10 kilo up. Well, who knows? Uh, and all I'm saying is that there's plenty of, of zinc in red meat and your bit of liver in bones. I didn't actually get a zinc content for bones. I should have tried a little bit harder about that. I'm sure bones are full of it. Uh, in fact, I know they are. It's They're full of water and calcium and then the harder uh, metals like zinc and iron and a few others, particularly the older bones, particularly the bigger animals and the older bones. Um. Not so much the poultry bones. You know, dead at 10 weeks full of water. That's why they're soft and springy. Anyway, um, it turns out for supplements-wise, if you were giving supplements, I've never known an issue or time to give Z. Oh, do you know what would have been, it would have been a great addition here? There is some uh, issues in dogs, like your Huskies and a few others where they have that uh, zinc issue, isn't it? That would have been a cool little addition here. It would have made me sound really smart. Um, oh, I'm not sure how to add it in now, but I do have an article written on it. So what I'll do is I'll somehow link to the article. But besides those dogs that may need it due to a genetic uh, mishap in the dog and they may need some zinc or whatever, okay, you know, but we're talking about the regular dogs. I really don't think regular dogs, other dogs, bar those dogs, um, shouldn't need a zinc supplement. But if you were reaching for a zinc supplement, then the chelated zinc, as always, minerals are not from the land of the living. They're inorganic elements as opposed to vitamins, which are, uh, the body absorbs much better. So, you, you know, these crappy synthetic vitamins they make in factories and you absorb them very easily. But the inorganics, the, the minerals, the zinc and iron and calcium and all that other stuff that they try to produce and sell to you, the body doesn't really like minerals at all. Uh, it likes minerals when they're holding the hand of a carbon molecule. It's called chelation. That's how minerals are found in nature. They're chelated in plants or prey animals. And then the body eats that. And the body, see, the body sees the carbon molecule. Come on in, you're invited. And he just brings his mate in holding his hand. That's chelation, okay? Holding the hand of a carbon molecule. So the best uh, zinc supplements are chelated supplements. That costs a bit of money to produce them that way. It can be done. Uh, they're available. Some really good pet foods, if they have to supplement with zinc for some reason, it'll be a type of zinc that'd be like an acetate or a citrate. They're good, they're good zinc uh, supplements and you'll be lucky to get them in any pet food. Um, far better absorbed by the body, deemed more bioavailable as a whole compared to the cheaper inorganic versions of zinc, including zinc sulfate and zinc oxide. They are the crap versions. Um. I also had some witty bits, as I said, because the lads weren't here. It's going to be harder to. Uh, we uh, we had an image up on the for this talk on zinc. We had an image up of oysters, and it is of course Valentine's Day today. If it's going, if this is going out on Valentine's Day, and uh, yeah, so I had some witty bits and pieces on aphrodisiacs to 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 amuse the lads with, but it's 
um harder um pardon the pun uh, when you are by yourself so i have uh i was going to ask the lads hey let's list some aphrodisiacs you know what what can you do we'll have an aphrodisiac off and um so i was going to get them to name some of the aphrodisiacs and i've done a little bit of research into uh the science behind them and i was going to ask them who thinks that there's any science behind the fact that oysters might actually have an effect on your sex drive or um you know, fertility or anything like that. Do you reckon there's any science behind that at all? Because I was led to believe, in my very naive opinion, as I haven't been on the planet, you know, a quarter as long as Bren and Nick, God knows, but I, naively, I just thought it was the shape of the vegetable. Asparagus looks a bit like a willy. Uh, aubergines. Um, so, you know, we all, we've, all, we've all seen the texts. But um, uh, oysters, same thing. You know, I'm just thinking, mm, yeah, you know, is it just because it looks like the parts and so that for, therefore it's all part? But then how are strawberries an aphrodisiac if they are an aphrodisiac? I mean, what do they look like? Um, so <laughs> we're all thinking. So uh, anyway, it turns out there is there is really good evidence that feeding oyster really gets you going. A study condu conducted on um, the feeding of a local oyster, Crassotria iridelli, is the Latin name for the, this oyster, increased mounting behavior in rats. Very interesting. Three doses, 50, 100, and 200 milligrams per kilo uh, of rat. And uh, they're big rats. How many kilos are we talking? Um and it, particularly they did uh, aqueous solutions and ethanol extracts from the muscle and they all had an effect and the more you gave them the more it worked uh, male mice treated with the ethanol extract particularly showed substantial evidences or increases in the mounting behavior uh, um, while only the small dose had only a mild aphrodisiac effect so that's interesting and then they did the that was in uh, mice was it and then they did it in rats and um, they, if they it really improve, it would improve capture counts. I'm not sure what that means of normal rats. Uh, the high oyster extracts have an androgen like effect on rats and can improve sexual function of rats. It's not a big leap. I think it might happen in humans too. So I thought that was very interesting. I think that's as much as I'm going to risk on uh, Valentine's Day. I, think, I thought maybe if we should have done a whole show on aphrodisiac foods, that would be cool. Like, what are the compounds that do that? And then I was asking the lads, uh, what else is out there from from aphrodisiac point of view? And I found a really cool review study of uh, aphrodisiacs. And uh, they they were investing two or three in particular that showed the most merit, a type of African asparagus that really apparently uh, came up with the goods. And uh, Chlorophytum brillialium in India uh, was just some pretty innocuous looking green plant with a little yellow flower. And then Corrigulo orcoides, and you're taking all this down, guys, an endangered flowering plant uh, of the genus Corrigulo, which is a native to Nepal and China and Japan, guys. So get your hiking boots on. But uh, you want to see the effect these have on people. Uh, this was like, oh no, hang on. Oh, it was rats again. Well, it was particularly impressive, though. Um, there was a, a result of trying all these different solutions on these rats. Um, oh my God. That was it. So I mean, the poor rats. I wonder if there was any female rats around. Um, the poor female rats in that case. But here was the maybe it wasn't male, but that's where they're trying. Maybe they were trying on female rats too. I even think it's a very male centric thing for me to think. Um, so it turned when they gave these male rats these aphrodisiacs, there was a significant variation in the sexual behavior of animals. Uh, and everything was enhanced, if you know what I mean, uh, resulting in reduced hesitation time. <laughs> and the indicator of attraction towards females. <laughs> reduced hesitation time. I love that. Uh, and resulted in an improved sexual behavior in all treated animals. So uh, the observed effects appear to be attributable to the testosterone-like effects of the extracts um so these results therefore support the folklore claim for the usefulness of these herbs and provide a scientific basis for the purported traditional usage so that's interesting uh so it is it was all pretty much about males there but um that is interesting there is a penile erection index apparently and uh this uh these herbs really do it's not bothered, so this was <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's funny that one of these plants is endangered, and I'm not surprised. <laughs> oh, very childish, Connor. Grow up, grow up. Um, so 
I'm off to uh, do a bit of herb shopping on Amazon and I hope you enjoyed my little spiel and uh, we will see you next week when services, normal services will resume. Thanks for bearing with me, everyone. And uh, I'll see you soon. Bye bye.